It's one thing to speak your mind at a newspaper in Saudi Arabia. It's another thing to do it at the Washington Post in America, in the capital. It was a profound lever of power that suddenly had been given to a person who wasn't afraid to speak out. He became a force in a way that no other journalist had ever been in Saudi Arabia. And now The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. My name is Matt Lutz. I am a professor of philosophy at Wuhan University, and I am a contributing writer for Persuasion. I want to talk a little bit about my article, Rhetorical Calvin Ball. The Rhetorical Calvin Ball article was inspired by the controversy over the Harper's letter that was published several months ago. There's two sides of this debate where some people are coming out in favor of free speech and other people are coming out against free speech. I thought that that was not the right way to frame the debate. People who are on the liberal left, the wokists, the practitioners of the successor ideology, whatever you want to call that, they're responding with speech. The thing is, they're just responding with weird and different kinds of speech. They weren't playing by the same rules of rational debate that most people who are involved in public discourse try to play by. They're doing another game, which is a game that I called Rhetorical Calvin Ball. It's based on a game that the protagonists in Calvin and Hobbes play. It's what I call a meta game, or it's a game about the game. The way that you win is by changing the rules on your opponent to make it so that whatever you are doing counts as winning, and whatever they are doing counts as losing. When you are arguing with someone who is a practitioner of the successor ideology, then it feels like you're playing rhetorical Calvin ball. It feels like they're changing the rules out from underneath you and making it so that whatever you try to do to win the debate actually is a penalty on you and not a penalty on them. When you're winning out correctly, that they are making some bad, irrational moves in the debate. For instance, one of the rational rules of debate is you should attack the argument, not the other person. If I give you an argument and there's a problem with it, then you show what the problem with my argument is. You don't call me a bad person for making that argument, right? You attack the argument, not the person. If you attack the person, not the argument, that's called the ad hominem fallacy. If you commit the ad hominem fallacy, I should be able to point out, no, 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 that's an ad hominem. You're attacking the person, not the argument. That's bad. You're not playing by the rules. But if you're debating with a practitioner of the successor ideology, then they're not going to accept that. They're not going to admit that they have committed a penalty. They've committed a foul. They're going to instead accuse you of trying to silence them and thereby score their own point by changing the rules. Another one of the rules of rational debate is to correctly represent the other person's argument. If you misrepresent my argument when you're attacking it, I get to point out that that's not what I said. That's not the argument that I was making. This is the straw man fallacy. Some of these people, if you accuse them of committing the straw man fallacy, they're going to respond that they are just saying what your argument needs to them. And if you are accusing them of committing the straw man fallacy, you are denying their truth. And now, of course, the penalty is again on you. It is, of course, understandable that people would want to change the rules of debate in order to put themselves in a better position to win. After all, there's lots of important issues going on in society these days. People who are on the left are arguing for some causes that they feel, perhaps correctly, are very, very important. And it might seem naive or overly genteel to insist on the rules of uh, Oxford debate. This is why Calvin invents Calvin Ball in the comic in the first place. He wants to have fun. He wants to win, but he's not having fun and he's not winning when he's playing by the normal rules. So he makes up new rules that he can have fun with and that he can win with. But it's important to remember why we play by these rules of debate in the first place. It's because these rules of debate are needed for discovering the truth. We often think of debate on an antagonistic model, but a better model is a, what's known as an agonistic model. In an agonistic competition, there is competition, but both participants are really working together to achieve 
some larger goal. In sports, the two different sides are going to compete, but they're really working together for some larger goal. There is an essential cooperative nature to the competition. And this is why we have these rules of rational debate. The goal is that we present the best arguments on both sides and arrive at the truth. The reason why the ad hominem fallacy is a fallacy is because personal characteristics or the personal virtues or vices of the person making the argument don't affect whether the argument is a good argument or not. It either supports its conclusion or it doesn't. So stick to the argument because that's the only way you're going to get to the truth. Similarly for the straw man fallacy. The reason why you need to stick to the argument that I actually made and not the argument that you would like to attack, the only way that we're going to get to the truth is by considering the best arguments on either side, not the arguments that are easiest to attack. The ultimate goal that a lot of people have in political debate is justice or a, a more perfect society. But you're not going to get to a more just, more perfect society if you are building your political ideology on a falsehood, on a lie. A noble lie is still a lie. You cannot build a just society on a web of falsehoods. If you really care about a more just, more perfect society, you need to understand the way the world actually is and work within the bounds of reality, which means we need to have an understanding of the way the world actually is, which means we need to engage in processes directed at truth rather than simply victory. Matt loves his piece called Rhetorical Calvin Ball was published by Persuasion. To learn more about the community we're building at Persuasion and to get similar articles directly into your inbox, head to www.persuasion.community. This conversation made me feel terribly unaccomplished. I have been speaking to Lawrence Wright. He is a staff writer at The New Yorker, the executive producer of a great new documentary movie called The Kingdom of Silence about Saudi Arabia. He has written a thriller about a pandemic which takes over in the Middle East that was released at terrible timing in April of this year. He's a real polymath. We spoke about the tragic murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the window it provides into US-Saudi relationship, but also about many other topics, how he has been able to find interesting topics time and again about Scientology, about twin studies and the debate of nature versus nurture. There's a lot in here. Lawrence Wright, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. Good to be with you. So you've just helped produce and you star in a documentary about America's relationship with Saudi Arabia and the life of Jamal Khashoggi, which is much more interesting and much more complicated than I'd realized, actually. You first met Jomo Khashoggi many decades ago. How did you end up becoming friendly with Khashoggi and making this documentary? You know, 9-11 is really what started it because I decided to write about that event and it became the looming tower. And I had to go to Saudi Arabia and the Saudis wouldn't let me in. They weren't letting any reporters in for the most part. So I got a job as an expat worker, <laughs> which is something they were still allowing. But my job was mentoring young reporters in Jeddah, which is Bin Laden's hometown. And it was great. You know, I mean, much better than being a reporter there. And moreover, I had all these young reporters. I could assign stories that I wanted about things I wanted to know. But, you know, reporting in Saudi Arabia, as is true in much of the Arab world, It's not what we think of as reporting. You know, there are things you can't write. You can't write about the government. You can't write about the royal family. You can't write about religion. It takes a lot off your plate. But there was one reporter in the whole country who actually was a true reporter, and that was Jamal Khashoggi. And I'm not saying that he, you know, went outside the boundaries, but he actually reported And that's how he made his name. He went to Afghanistan and reported on the jihad against the Soviets. Moreover, he wasn't afraid to speak out. You know, one thing about living in a tyranny is it turns people into cowards. And Jamal was not a coward. Uh, he was cautious sometimes, you know, but he would tell you what he thought. And I was eager to meet him. And he was working for a competitive newspaper that was far better than the one I worked for. 
So I arranged to go over and talk to him. And what I found out right away is he's a great guy. I just really enjoyed it. He had a great sense of humor and uh, we got along very well. That's when we met. It was in February, 2003. And then about a month after we met, Jamal got appointed editor of this paper in Southern Arabia called Al-Watan. It's in a seer, which was where a lot of the hijackers came from. And I went down to visit him there. It was the same week that we invaded Iraq. And it was very strange to me because every Saudi I met was fiercely opposed to that, except for Jamal. And so tell us a little bit about his ideological evolution, because he was a strong supporter of the fight against the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, and he actually ended up being relatively close to Osama bin Laden at that time. And then I guess within a 15-year time span, you know, Osama bin Laden becomes fiercely critical, not just of the United States, but also of the Saudi government, the Saudi royal family. And Khashoggi, at that point, is in very good standing with the Saudi government and actually is one of a few... Saudis who really seems to support America's invasion of Iraq. So tell us a little bit about sort of, is that an ideological turnabout? Is there some coherence to that? Is there some through line there? How does Khashoggi get to that point? I guess, you know, Yasha, when we talk about Jamal, we're talking about a person who's in constant evolution. That's one of the things that I think really marks him and makes his story so interesting. And there are really kind of three points along, you know, there's the jihad, there's 9-11 and there's the Arab Spring. Those are the three acts of Jamal Khashoggi's drama. And both Jamal and bin Laden were in the Muslim Brothers when they were young, which was an underground organization, very dangerous in Saudi Arabia. So they came out of a radical orientation and they had that in common. The Mujahideen are fighting in Afghanistan and bin Laden goes and Jamal meets him there. And he's acting as a real journalist. He's writing about a Saudi. Jamal is being a war correspondent. To some extent, maybe to a large extent, Jamal burnished the legend of Osama bin Laden, a Saudi, not a prince, but a princeling, who is in Afghanistan helping the Muslim cause. It made bin Laden famous. It turned him into a celebrity, which is a category they never had in Saudi Arabia. You know, in Saudi Arabia, there's the royal family and everybody else. And there was this disruptive figure of bin Laden when he came back to the kingdom. And the other thing is Jamal had a voice. He discovered that he had a voice, which was an iffy proposition in Saudi Arabia because the princes own all the newspapers. They own all the cable outlets. They own most of the newspapers in the whole Arab world. You know, so they control the narrative. And here is someone who has begun to build an independent constituency. And so not only was bin Laden a volatile element inside Saudi Arabia, Jamal was too in his own way. But at that stage, right in the 2000s, Khashoggi and bin Laden really go very separate ways, which to say that, as I understand it, bin Laden becomes a very devoted critic of the Saudi royal family as well. But Khashoggi actually starts to take on government functions, right? He becomes a spokesman for the government in London and then in Washington, D.C. So, you know, explain to me, I guess, Khashoggi's reasons for supporting the Saudi royal family, for supporting the United States, for supporting the Eurasian in Iraq, and how then he starts to fall out with the royal family at the time of the Arab Spring, which I suppose sets the stage for his gruesome murder later on. Yeah. When bin Laden went to Sudan in 92 to 96, you know, Jamal was critical of al-Qaeda and he had distanced himself from Osama. But the royal family sent him to Sudan to try to woo bin Laden back to the kingdom and get him to shut up about the king. (laughs) He was talking trash and, and they were very upset with him. And they promised to pay him a lot of money if he had just come back and settled down. And that was the message that Jamal took to Khartoum. And, you know, bin Laden never consented to that. That may be the last time that Jamal and bin Laden saw each other. And then, you know, even as early as 2003, when I was in Saudi Arabia the first time, and he was editor of Al-Watan, he was trying to enlarge the space of public discourse 
And he did something that, you know, you'd have to understand the context of Saudi Arabia. He published a cartoon. This was just one of many things, but it really struck me. There was a cartoon of a suicide bomber, and it was a cleric. And instead of dynamite in the pockets of the vest, there were thought was. This was outrageous. Because it was seen as a strong criticism of a cleric. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was crossing a red line, not just criticizing, making fun of. Absolutely taboo. And the editor of the newspaper I work for called me out in the hall because they think that their offices are bugged. And he said, you know, your friend Jamal, the word is, you know, he's going to be killed. This was 2003. And it was the first time I heard that he was under a death threat. Then about a year later, I think, I was in the United States and I got a call from Jamal and he was in danger. He needed to get out of the country. And I arranged for Columbia Journalism School to take him on as an adjunct professor. And so I had a spot for him if he needed it. But at that point, Prince Turkey al Faisal put Jamal under his wing. He made him a spokesperson for the London embassy where Turkey was the ambassador and then to Washington. So, you know, Jamal had protection and that's what the royal family offered him at that point. But, you know, he had already been very critical of bin Laden. So he was in a space where he was moving away. He never became a heretic, but he moved away from the kind of radical position of his youth. He never became a royal family factotum. I mean, the thing about Jamal is he was between everything. He was between bin Laden and the royal family. He was between Saudi Arabia and America. And it, he was just in a unique position. There were very few people, maybe no other people, that had the reach that he did and was not a prince of some sort. So I guess then in the 2000s, Khashoggi is in a strange position where he's starting to really provoke the religious extremists, he's starting to provoke the clerical establishment. That really courts danger, but he also has a protection of at least parts of the royal family, and he's a spokesman for the Saudi government. So I suppose then the third act starts with the Arab Spring, which Khashoggi enthusiastically embraced. And my understanding is that at that point, he loses a lot of that protection. How does he go from being quite close to the Saudi family, at least parts of it, to embracing these inspiring movements around the Arab world that were challenged in a deep way? And what then is the actual instigator of his murder? Why is it that it is in 2019, when the Arab Spring is long past, that by all appearances, the highest levels of the Saudi royal family decide to have him killed? Well, you know, start with the fact that Jamal had a mission early on, which was to enlarge the space of free speech in Saudi Arabia. One can't call it free speech, but we can say enlarge the space for speech at all. And, you know, that's what he tried to do at al Watan. He was actually hired there twice. I think the second time he lasted for a less than a week. And then under one of the princes, Prince Walid, he was offered the job of starting a new news channel called Al-Arab and hired some of the best journalists in the whole Arab world. It lasted for less than an hour. It was shut down immediately. And that shows you that there is no space for free talk in Saudi Arabia. And that was very discouraging to Jamal. And he went back to the kingdom. He was writing for Al Hayat, which is the largest pan-Arab newspaper. And that was taken away. And so finally, they shut down his Twitter account. And he called me at that point, And he said, things have never been worse. They've taken away my right to speak at all. And he was afraid for his life. With all the threats he had endured on his life in the 17 years that I knew him, I never heard him be afraid. And he was afraid. And he realized he was going to have to make a break. And that meant leaving his family, uprooting himself from his country, and trying to find a perch on his own. There was no royal protection any longer. So he came to America, and it was so fortuitous that he found that job at the Washington Post. Now, I'll talk a minute about that, and I'll get back to the Arab Spring. 
it's one thing to speak your mind at a newspaper in Saudi Arabia. It's another thing to do it at the Washington Post in America, in the capital. It was a profound lever of power that suddenly had been given to a person who wasn't afraid to speak out. So the threat he posed for, I guess, perception of Saudi Arabia in the West and in the capital of the United States just had increased dramatically. And that sort of increased the danger for him in a direct way. Yeah, he became a force in a way that no other journalist had ever been in Saudi Arabia. And also his views had changed. And it was the Arab Spring that suddenly galvanized Jamal. I mean, I think he had a lot of inchoate ideas about where you could go, you know, what kind of progress you might be able to make in the Arab world. And then suddenly the Arab world was on fire and all these young people were demanding change. And it drew from something inside him that, you know, he realized this is something he'd always yearned for, but never expected that it could be made a real possibility. And so he became wholeheartedly engaged with the Arab Spring. And, you know, the Saudis actually helped the Egyptian government put down expressions of change in Tahrir Square. And, you know, they backed Sisi and, you know, they squashed it because they didn't want it to get anywhere close to the kingdom. And I think at that point, there was no place for Jamal anymore in Saudi Arabia. So what do we know about what ultimately instigated the murder of Khashoggi? Why was it in 2019? And what's the evidence that it went all the way to the top, which meant by 2019 to Mohammed bin Salman? I think there were several things that were going on at the same time. One was, you know, Jamal had his perch of power, which was very threatening. And then, you know, the other thing is that MBS came into power. The last time I saw Jamal, I had arranged for us to have a little conversation at the university here in Austin, Texas, where I live. And frankly, Yasha, I was perplexed because to me, MBS seemed like a reformer. And a lot of the changes that young people that I had worked with in Saudi Arabia had yearned for, movies and women driving and so on, MBS was giving him those things. So that's what I saw. But what Jamal saw was that the people that were advocating for the very reforms that were being enacted were being persecuted. And the women drivers, for instance, you know, thrown in prison without any charge and tortured for advocating, they're still in prison, for advocating the very changes that MBS enacted. So it took me a while to understand, but there's a concept in sociology called the King's Paradox, which is the more the tyrant releases power, the more the demand is for more changes. And I think that this is MBS's strategy, is to have, on the one hand, a process of liberalization, and on the other side, a crackdown on freedoms. And there will only be one person advocating for reform. It's consonant with the idea that there's only one voice that speaks in the kingdom. I see. So he wants to actually liberalize the country in certain respects, but he wants to be the one granting this liberalization and he's not going to tolerate any grassroots demands for them. Is is that what he's saying? Yes. And I think also, Yasha, as for the crime itself, I think there are two things going on. One, I think they thought it was perfect. They had a plan they thought was bulletproof. Not only were they going to cut him up and dissolve his body in acid, which is what I think they did, they had some lookalike who was going to put on his clothes. And, you know, I mean, no, who could say that, you know, that the Saudis had anything to do with it? But the other part of it was Jamal would be missing and everybody would suspect the crown prince of ordering it, but there'd be no evidence. So it was the best of both worlds. You have a sense that you don't cross MBS, but there'd be no evidence to fairly accuse him. Unfortunately, they didn't realize that the Turks had the embassy <laughs> filmed, and so they, they had no idea how totally penetrated they were. Were it not for that, I think that this whole crime probably would have been in some ways forgotten because there would be no way to pin it on anybody. Well, the problem with perfect crimes is that you're usually not thinking about something, but it's striking that it wouldn't occur 
to people at the highest level of government that the embassy may be under surveillance. I mean, isn't that a relatively obvious thing to think of as a possibility? Well, when knuckleheads are carrying out the crime, <laughs> you find that they might make some mistakes. It's sort of hard for me to talk about because, uh, you know, when I consider what they did to a, such a fine man and a courageous fellow, it's just very galling. And, uh, you know, I would love to see some kind of accountability. There's not going to be. You know, the only people that can enforce a change are MBS's cousins. And if it happens that the cost of having this guy in power is too great, then a change will come. But they, too, are all cowed by him. So your documentary, Kingdom of Silence, talks not just about the really fascinating and tragic story of Jamal Khashoggi, but it really tries to understand the U.S.-Saudi relationship through his life and times, in a way. So why don't we step back a moment, because this is something that as somebody whose foreign policy expertise is more based on Europe and other countries to some extent Asia, has always puzzled me, which is to say, you know, the United States and Saudi Arabia are in so many obvious ways opposites. They're in so many obvious ways not natural partners at all. And yet they have had for 40, 50 years a very strong and close partnership, which presidents who come in being very critical of the relationship end up perpetuating, because clearly there is some constellation of mutual interest that makes it very compelling. So explain to us, you know, why it is that the United States and Saudi Arabia are allies, you know, and, and how that strange alliance has been able to last for so long, despite all the obvious reasons why one might wish that it weren't the case. You know, I kind of consider Saudi Arabia like America's foster child. It started as an act of charity. There was an heir to a toilet manufacturing <laughs> organization. They still, I've forgotten the name, but you still see them on urinals every once in a while. But this fellow went to Saudi Arabia and it was in the 30s and it was incredibly impoverished. And he met the king and uh, the king was grateful for his kind words about the incipient kingdom. And um, the American said, is there something that I can do for you? And he said, you know, what we need is water. You know, there must be some water somewhere in this desert. You know, if you could send a geologist, you know, to try to help us. And so a geologist was sent and did a survey of the kingdom. And he came back to the king and he said, I've got good news and bad news. Bad news, no water. Good news, lots of oil. <laughs> lots of oil. And you know, people think of Saudi Arabia as being, you know, conservative and slow to change. But you have to realize what happened in the next couple of decades. There were people who, some of them living, getting their protein from eating insects to owning yachts and, you know, hanging out in the Mediterranean and shopping on the Champs-Élysées. You know, this happened within a few years for many of them. It was a total cultural shift. No country perhaps has changed as rapidly and profoundly as Saudi Arabia did in that time. And why was it important to us after that? Well, mainly the main thing was Saudi Arabia had all this oil. War came along and the importance of oil became far more apparent. And after the war, everybody was driving cars and keeping the price of gas low was important. From a geopolitical point of view, there was Europe. It was far easier to get that oil from Saudi Arabia to Europe. And as long as America trying to protect the seaways, we had a block on the Soviets. There was oil from another source. Russia is, of course, in some of the former provinces that were pretty oil rich themselves. So there was a counterweight. But now the reasons for our relationship with Saudi Arabia are beginning to fray. The price of oil is low. America became the leading oil exporter for a while before the crash. We'll see what happens you know, when the sun comes out again. But Israel is strong, certainly the strongest power in the Middle East. And so we don't feel quite as threatened for Israel's sake. And oil is disappearing from the future. Even Saudi Arabia is building solar cells and nuclear power plants, and they have the most abundant oil imaginable. So 
why have this relationship in the future? I think my feeling about it, Yasha, is that Saudi Arabia is going to need our help. I forecast a very troubled time for Saudi Arabia soon because as long as the price of oil stays low, and I think it's going to stay low for a long time, and maybe will never regain its heights. Saudi Arabia can't afford to be the kind of welfare state that the princes have created to mollify the population. And it's going to come to a point where people are going to ask, what do we need this royal family for? They're not giving us what we expected. And that's a crisis moment for that country. And Saudis are frightened of revolution. Many will talk to you about their fear of tribal warfare, which was, you know, the sort of before there was the royal family, you know, there was, you know, tribe against tribe. And I don't know if that's a likely outcome, but it could be. And then if you look at the revolutions that have taken place in their neighborhood, in Iran and Yemen and Libya and <laughs> Iraq, you know, they turn out pretty badly. So I think the Saudis are right to be anxious about what kind of future might await them without the royal family they have. Of course, ironically, one of the reasons why those revolutions turned out badly was the influence from Saudi Arabia. For obviously, there was many other reasons too. What would you recommend to an incoming Biden administration in terms of its relationship to Saudi Arabia? I imagine, especially as, as a friend of Jamal Khashoggi, you would love some accountability for what happened to him. So it's very hard to imagine how that accountability might be won beyond, you know, some of the stooges, some of the knuckleheads, as you called them, who carried out the operation being punished, um, which I suppose is some form of satisfaction, but the likelihood that the people who actually ordered it will be held accountable seems extremely low. The country continues to be very different from us in terms of values, in terms of its treatment of women, in terms of the treatment of dissidents, in terms of the amount of personal freedom it allows. And yet it is not, as you were saying, in the interest of the United States to either destabilize Saudi Arabia or potentially push it in a direction where it uh, encourages terrorism more actively than even it has in the past. So how could sort of an administration that looks at this with the right set of values try and balance this incredibly difficult mix of considerations? The number one thing is stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia. You know, it's made us complicit in this total war crime, which is the war in Yemen. We've been refueling the bombers that are destroying all these citizens. And just stop that. Make sure that members of the royal family realize that there is a reputational cost to keeping MBS in power. It's not our place to try to engineer a coup. It's our place to express our displeasure with this current situation. And to some extent, I don't think that we need to be engaged in the Middle East anymore. You know, the Middle East is a very difficult place to reform. And it's maybe better if we just withdraw our interest altogether and let them sort it out. Because, you know, I think that we've acted as an enabler and allowed this to go on in its dismal progress for too long. And it implicates us in what happens. The lesson I learned from living in the Middle East is that things can always get worse. And trying to help sometimes doesn't help at all. So I think it's better for us to pay attention to things that we can change and make better. And I don't know if we can do that in the Middle East. As a Good Fight listener, I know you are committed to understanding what it means to live in a democracy and how we can all work together to preserve and promote democratic ideals. My name is Jenna Spinelli, and I'm the founder of a podcast network called The Democracy Group, a collection of shows devoted to democracy, civic engagement, and the free expression of ideas. Our member shows include Another Way by Lawrence Lessig, the Solutions Journalism podcast, How Do We Fix It?, and Swamp Stories from Issue One, which looks at political reform through a conservative lens. If you enjoy the conversations you hear on The Good Fight, I know you'll enjoy our shows too. You can find more information about the network and our member shows at democracygroup.org. Again, that's democracygroup.org. 
Well, moving on from the tragic and depressing topic of the US-Saudi relationship and Donald Khashoggi to the tragic and depressing topic of the pandemic, you know, because you're a polymath who thinks about many different things and writes and work in many different formats. You had a novel, a kind of thriller, I suppose, called The End of October, which was published on April 28th of 2020, but obviously written well before that about a global pandemic in the Middle East as it happens. What surprises you about COVID-19, um, given that you had thought about what a global pandemic might look like and how it might affect societies? What did you never predict and what left you surprised now that it has come to your own country rather than to countries in the Middle East? Well, the latest surprise for me is that one of the people who gets the virus in my novel is the president. <laughs> so I, uh, it doesn't turn out well for the president in the novel. You know, my virus is much more mortal. The virus COVID-19 is much more contagious. I underestimated some things. I miscalculated how willing individuals would be to isolate themselves for such long periods of time. And a great personal cost and impoverished by it. And I certainly underestimated the resilience of the stock market. On the other hand, many things are exactly as I envision them. And it's not because I'm prescient. It's because everybody knew what was going to happen. The public health people all knew what would happen. They didn't know when. There are playbooks like the Obama playbook that was passed off to the Trump administration. The Trump administration itself had a table talk exercise called Crimson Contagion, where an American traveler to China comes back and he's coughing. And then when he gets home, his son goes to a concert. And within seven months, you know, 500,000 Americans are dead. Well, it's not just that that scenario is spookily like the one that we're living. It's that, you know, bear in mind, this is a tabletop exercise. There are cabinet members there. There the Red Cross. And what's going to be the problem? Well, there's not enough PPE. There are not enough ventilators. You know, one department doesn't talk to another. You know, I mean, all the things that happened were envisioned by the Trump administration itself. So you might think that, when this virus happened, they would have the advantage of knowing, first of all, we can go to the Obama playbook. It's like paint by numbers. You know, if this happens, call this person. And then also we have the gain the wisdom of knowing where our fault lines are. It's as if neither of those things ever happened. And that's where I think I was totally right in the novel, that people behave better than I expected, but governments, especially our own, behave pretty much as I imagined. It's interesting that the surprises are positive ones because this feels like such a depressing time and it's so clear how much the government has failed, especially in the United States, but actually, you know, there's been failures in many countries, especially at the beginning and at many levels of government within the United States. But the positive surprises are striking to me. I mean, it's surprising the stock market is so resilient, for sure. And it's easy to paint this in negative terms, which is to say that there's something sort of sociopathic about the stock market and this terrible thing is going on, but stocks aren't impacted by it. And that seems to show that there's just something broken with our economic system. I think there's a more optimistic case to be made, which is that to a surprising extent, the economic system itself has proven to be resilient. Even the United States has managed to put in place uh, economic protective measures that have somewhat buffered the economic impact throughout society. There's obviously a lot of people suffering, and I don't want to underplay that, but less so than we imagined five or six months ago. And, you know, there was all of these jokes in March and April that, oh, look, you know, actually capitalism doesn't turn out to be any better than socialism. Look at all the things that are sold out and out of stock, and this is like we're in the Soviet Union. But I'm surprised and astounded how limited those things turned out to be. Yeah, for a week or two, there was a run on toilet paper and it was a little hard to get toilet paper. But now you can get all the toilet paper you want, you know, at the click of a button from Amazon. You know, it's still a little hard to get, you know, outdoor heaters at the moment. And at some point in June, it was hard to get standing desks. But I mean, to an amazing extent, our economic system has been uninfected by that. And not just in terms of the evaluation of some company, but in terms of the ability of people to get food on the table, to have electricity in the house, to have running water, to have all of the necessities 
in this incredibly complex society. That to me was a surprise. I don't know how you feel about that. No, I agree. And in, in my novel, I, you know, I postulated that the internet goes down and that changed a lot. Think about where we would be if that happened. And then also in the food supply it becomes problematic. And we've been really lucky in that regard. You know, as for the stock market and the economy, the stock market and the real economy are running in opposite directions. And I, I've been talking to a lot of economists about this. And one of my contacts at Goldman Sachs was talking about how the mission of Wall Street is to take money out of failed enterprises and put it into the companies that we need now. And you know what happened in March was that huge drop in the stock market, but also you know the, the economy just went to hell. And then there was this amazing climb back by the stock market. And the Goldman guy said it was the rush to opportunity. And there are companies that are going out of business. They say a third of small businesses in New York will never come back. Well, that may be true. There are two schools on this that I found that go back to Keynes and Hayek. Keynes being, you know, fill the system with money. You have to give the economy a boost. And then people will even if it's somebody digging holes, it puts him back in the economic system. And then there's Hayek, which is let the weak things die. And it opens up the opportunity for new things to grow. Well, both of those things are at play right now. And it's, it's an interplay. Our country is trying to navigate a path between these two things. And the main problem is going to be lower tier workers. Say what you want about the Trump administration. It was true that people at the bottom tier of income were making higher wages at last. You know, there really was movement towards increased savings. They, actually, the people in the lower quintile of pay were getting a proportionally higher rates of wages than people in the upper tier. Uh, higher rates of wage increases. Yes. So things were moving in a positive direction, but it's exactly those people who are suffering the most and are likely to find that their jobs aren't there when this all comes to an end. And the jobs for those people will have to be entirely recreated. And moreover, there's such a surplus of labor now that it's going to be very difficult for them to nudge the price of labor up because there's a surplus of it. Yeah, it's a fascinating realization about the contemporary economy that a huge percentage of middle income and upper income workers turn out to be able to do their work from wherever. And so they're not particularly affected by the pandemic. And it turns out that all kinds of complex institutions can work perfectly well, perhaps not as well as before, but perfectly well without ever being in the same place at the same time. Thanks to Zoom and other inventions, you can communicate pretty well. And then there's a huge swath of the economy where lower wage workers tend to be concentrated, in which that's not the case. You can't serve somebody online. You can't produce meat via Zoom. You can't be in agriculture via Zoom and so on and so forth. Since we're talking about predictions, you know, I was struck again in March and April and May by the extent to which people predicted that everything would change after Corona. And I think this is one of the things I myself got right at the time, which is to say, I wrote an article, for example, to say, I don't think globalization is going to end because of COVID-19. International trade is not going to end because of COVID-19. And certainly these ideas that socializing is going to change in a dramatic way, that people will no longer have parties, that there's no longer going to be any bars, that restaurants will not just temporarily go out of business, but that people will never want to go back to eating at restaurants. That all struck me as pretty nuts. And I think at least in this sort of summer of a pandemic, the extent to which people rushed back to those opportunities in so far as it was at all possible, I think seems to vindicate that. I agree with that to some extent, but I think COVID-19 hasn't been like a war on cities, but it has been a war on the idea of cities. And, you know, here in Austin, you know, we have all these cranes that were in the middle of constructing new office towers. There's a lot of, uh-oh, maybe I don't need all that space. And I think that, you know, New York in particular is going to suffer from the idea that people don't need to be congregated in the place where they work. There are long-term consequences that if we can get out of this in the next few months, 
may not be so severe. For instance, I work in the theater a lot, and I'm very concerned about the future of the theater. It's a precious place for me. It's been put off most of the plays, and some of them scrapped all even all next year. So what's going to happen there? I don't know. But, you know, that's a huge part of the experience of New York. And it could be that, you know, there'll be a tremendous dispersal of arts and business and so on away from some of the epicenter type places. I think the fires in the West are going to have a similar demographic push. You know, my wife has asthma, for instance. Well, she couldn't live almost in any Western state right now. And how many people have asthma? There are profound changes headed our way. But I don't think that it's easy to predict them. That's, I think, where we fall down is that we think, oh, you know, nobody's going to want to go to a restaurant. Well, no, you're right. You know, people love to go to restaurants. I'm in a band, for instance, and, you know, all the bars are nailed up. I don't know. I say I'm in a band. I used to be in a band. I don't know if we have a band anymore. I haven't seen these guys for months. But, you know, the urge to get together and play music with my friends is so powerful. And I'm sure we'll find a way to do that. But it has been a caution. And the other thing I think is, this is not the last pandemic. You know, I think of COVID-19 as a harbinger. And since the turn of the millennium, we've had Ebola and Nipah and Zika and SARS-1 and MERS, and the pace is picking up. You know, it was unusual to have a new disease. Now it's not unusual. Now you can feel that we're being assaulted with one new dangerous virus after another, and our capacity to deal with those things has not really improved that much since the 1918 flu. So we've only scratched the breadth of your interests and the breadth of your expertise. You wrote a very influential book about Scientology and a very critical book about Scientology. You also have a great book that I'd love to talk to you about if we had the time on twin studies and what oh, yeah. twins tell us about human nature and the way that they reshape the debate about nature versus nurture. But instead of asking you about each of these individual topics, I'd love to know a little bit about your process. How do you decide what's worth thinking and writing about and how do you often end up being prescient on which of these topics to pursue? How do you decide what kind of medium to engage in since you've done everything from journalism to fiction to documentaries to theater? And how do you actually make progress on those things? Well, the hardest part of that question is deciding what to write. It's a mystery to me, honestly. I don't understand the, you know, where inspiration comes from. I work hard at trying to be inspired. You know, I leaf through you know magazines and newspapers hungrily looking for new topics that will not just. I mean, there are a million things to write about. Every newspaper every day has something fascinating to write about, but it has to hit a note inside you. It has to ring some bell. And usually, when I get an idea that I'm going to actually pursue, it comes encased in the form. You know, it's like, hello, I'm a play, you know, or, you know, hello, I'm a nonfiction article. But sometimes, you know, those things, you discover that the story can be manifested in many different ways. David Remnick at The New Yorker asked me to explain Texas, for instance. And I said, well, David, that's a big question, and I get paid by the word, so, you know, I'll be happy to answer it. And I wrote the book. And I had already written a play about Texas politics. And after I wrote the book, I'm now working on a musical. And, you know, Remnick says, I eat the whole animal. The thing is that the idea is the most precious thing. You know, the form is secondary. The, the fact that you have encountered a subject that resonates with you, that's the first thing. Looking back, I realize that I tend to be drawn to exploring worlds that I'd never been in before. You know, like Scientology. I'm, I've written a lot about religion over the years. But, you know, Scientology is a peculiar, interesting ecosystem of humanity. And I wanted to know more about it. It was on my plate forever. But when I approach something like that, I need a way in. And usually it's a person. And I call that person a donkey because 
it sounds demeaning, but a donkey is a noble beast of burden. And, you know, he can carry the reader into a world he's never seen and carry a lot of information on his back. And my theory is if you care about this person, who doesn't need to be a celebrity, in fact, that's probably a mistake, just a person who inhabits that world, if you care about that person, you'll be far more engaged with the information that the writer needs to communicate. So I see a golden opportunity here, which is to kill two birds with one stone, to understand more about your process and perhaps at least tease a couple of the other things that you've worked on. So tell us, you know, who was your donkey to Scientology and what is it that you learned through them? I had waited for the right person. When Travolta had his son's death, and it seemed like he might be leaving Scientology. I proposed to Remnick that I write about that. And he said, it's too tabloid. <laughs> so he was probably right. But finally, then Paul Haggis, a two-time Academy Award-winning screenwriter and director, dropped out of Scientology after three decades. And I thought what I liked about him as a donkey is that he had been in it for a long time. He was smart. He was skeptical. He was fiercely intelligent. And I thought most readers would read about Scientology with a sneer on their lips. And I wanted to wipe that off. I wanted them to feel threatened, you know, and also be drawn into the fact that here is somebody who is at least as smart as I am, who, you know, dedicated much of his life to serving this church. And why? What did he get out of it? And so that's why Paul Haggis, also, he was very courageous in speaking to me, as were so many people who were later punished so badly by the church. I was really fortunate with Haggis because he was so perceptive about his own status. He was reflective about it. And that's a quality that you really pretty much need in your donkey. Without running the risk of insulting you, what was your donkey in between story? Well, it was less a donkey than a discovery. I had been interested in twin studies. I don't have twins. I'm not a twin. But, you know, the idea that there would be somebody else out there that is genetically you, I mean, it's not you, but it's as you as anything else can be. And, you know, I, I had twin friends in school and stuff like that. And I uncovered a study that was done. It, it was an obscure study, but it was about two girls that were in the study named Amy and Beth. And they were identical twins. They were adopted at birth into separate families. And one family was very dysfunctional and treated her as a kind of outsider. And the other was extremely accepting. The mother even at some point dyed her own hair to resemble Beth's hair so that Beth would feel more included. And, but Amy, you know, wet her bed and she, you know, she acted out, she had sexual dysfunctions. And, you know, you think, well, not, not surprising, you know, given that dysfunctional family. Beth was even worse. So wait a minute, you know, these are all supposed to be things that the environment has something to say in. But what I found when I studied it more is that these girls had been intentionally separated and that they had been a part of a study, uh, a perfect study. I can understand Dr. Peter Neubauer, who was the head of the Freud archives, who was the genius behind this. I can understand why he would be drawn to creating a study where twins are purposely separated at birth so you can study the interplay of genes versus environment without the conflicting problem of having the actual family there. <laughs> and so that was, that was what drew me to it. But if I understand that study correctly, it was obviously unethical to separate these girls in order to study them. It was the perfect study in the sense that it proved a very strong point about nature versus nurture. But my understanding is that the people who set up the study expected that the life outcomes of these two girls would end up being widely divergent. And it turned out to be the quote-unquote perfect study in the opposite way to what they had hoped. But that's probably why the study's never been released. You know, it's been locked up in the Beinecke Library for, I've forgotten when it's supposed to be released, but 
bear in mind, Neubauer was, you know, he had been the head of the Freud archives and he was, you know, a Freudian. He was in many ways the father of child psychiatry in America. And he had a great investment in showing that the environment was dominant. And no, it's not, as it turns out. Genes are at least 50% of our behavioral and intelligence quotients. So, yeah, it must have been pretty dismaying when the results began to come in. That's a problem with perfect study. They might not find what you want them to. Well, listen, I recommend to all of my listeners to watch The Kingdom of Silence and to read The End of October and to follow your wonderful work. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces.